I'm honored today to introduce Dr. Marla Dubinsky for her grand rounds on a personalized approach to IBD from prediction to prevention. Dr. Dubinsky received her medical degree from Queen's University in Canada and completed her clinical pediatric gastroenterology training at St. Justine Hospital in the University of Montreal. She then went on to complete her research fellowship in inflammatory bowel diseases at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Dr. Dubinsky is extraordinarily well published in the field of IBD. She has a specific research interest in the influence of genetics and immune responses on the variability of clinical presentations and treatment responses in IBD. Dr. Dubinsky previously acted as the director of the Pediatric Inflammatory <coughs> Bowel Disease Center at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles before coming here to Mount Sinai. She currently serves as chief of the division of pediatric gastroenterology and is a professor of pediatrics here at Mount Sinai. Please join me in war giving a warm welcome to Dr. Marla Dubinsky. Wow, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Rose. Um, thank you again for inviting me to come and speak at your uh, grand rounds. It's really a pleasure for me more to speak really about all the amazing stuff that we're doing here at Sinai to sort of give you a window into um, our focus here at really changing the paradigm of care of IBD. So I thought I would take you on a journey and think a little bit outside the box. I'm not going to be talking about any therapies that we have for inflammatory bowel disease. I'm really going to take you back to what are the things we really want to know about IBD so we can actually make groundbreaking, groundbreaking advances in the field. These are my disclosures. So imagine if we can accurately predict disease course and complications, personalized therapy to individualize patients targeting their unique biology, closely monitor and tailor medications to ensure optimal durable response and prevent IBD at, at, um, in at-risk individuals. It's interesting, most of the language around a lot of research focuses on cure. And notice how I haven't mentioned the word cure in sort of when I think about what really the future of IBD needs to be about. And it's probably difficult to find a cure in a disease that has close to 300 genes, trillion bacteria, infinite environmental triggers for which it's very difficult to find one genotype that then predicts a certain phenotype, which makes cure maybe uh, a little bit elusive. So that's why I'm going to focus a little bit on redefining cure and focusing on prevention. So is this a dream or is this a reality? So what is our dream? Our dream is to understand that the natural history of IBD, particularly Crohn's, where we have a really good handle on what is the natural history of IBD, we know that you start in an inflammatory state and then you progress to either bowel wall damage that results in either fibrosis or muscle thickening resulting in narrowings or what we call uh, strictures or fibrostenotic disease with possible fistulizing, so tunnels through the bowel wall, resulting in abscesses, uh, and then we go to surgery and we start this cycle over. And this is sort of the presumed natural history in the era of ineffective therapies, which really was before 1998, before we really had biologic-based therapies, or what I call the biologic revolution, which was the introduction of our first anti-TNF therapy, most notably infliximab. So the reality is, is unfortunately, the way we manage IBD is we wait for complications to occur, designate the patient as a complicated patient, and then say, I'm going to actually now use an effective therapy that does not reverse scar tissue once formed and actually is not very adequate at closing fistulas per se in the bowel wall. So the question is, what is a better way of managing, which is to take advantage of a window of opportunity at which it is an inflammatory state for which you can prevent bowel wall damage or prevent disease progression. The reality, unfortunately, particularly for Crohn's disease therapy, is that the majority of patients, their first initial therapy are actually drugs that are not effective, well, 5-ASAs that are not effective nor approved for IBD therapy. And that is the majority of first-line approaches in that window of opportunity is ineffective therapies that have no role in mucosal healing and do not have a biologic effect. So this is really the gap that we have, which is how do we get better therapies targeting the biology in that window of opportunity and what is the barrier for that to be happening? So what is the disconnect between re, uh, reality and sort of where we aspire to be? Obviously, the payer for anyone who manages an IBD patient knows that the payer is extremely obstructive 
and actually has, really uses money and the cost, lowest cost, race to the bottom therapy that's going to be effective in their minds, which is often not the effective therapy that you would like to use for your patient. Patients are scared of side effects. The concept of a biologic is really lost on them. They often think that it must be related to chemotherapy. If there's infusions or injectables, there's somewhat of a perception that goes along with the fact that biologics must be not safe based on their route of administration. They also feel like they need to earn it which is similar to that diagram I showed you where people feel, I'm, I'm not sure, the patient looks okay and feels okay right now, but I have no concept of the future because I really don't have a crystal ball. And the patient feels well enough that everything is okay and I don't earn it, I'm not sick enough for what we call a biologic-based therapy. That is a big problem for us because I've now just, you know, just sort of presented our dichotomy and where we want to be and the reality of what is happening in the management of IBD, which is why we're not changing the natural history at the pace that we think we can change the natural history. Doctors are also part of this story. They don't want to use biologics again until the patient feels that the, until they feel that the patient has earned it. The problem is a lot of us confuse disease activity, which is at the moment how the patient feels and is active, versus what does their future look like or encompass what we call disease severity, which is the entire picture of a patient. It's not just how many stools and how much abdominal pain you have today. And that's the problem. We're often very reactive to how a patient feels today, and we don't encompass the risk of progression or their underlying risk of their biology. And it really is difficult in today's era. It's going to get better, I hope, in some use of some new tools that we're applying to the clinic, but to identify patients up front regardless of how many stools they're having, regardless of where their disease is located, for example, and say, I know you feel okay today, but your trajectory is such that you will end up in the OR in the next two years. Therefore, I need to actually intervene and give you a biologic-based therapy. This is sort of, again, where we get into trouble because we're not reacting to their severity, we're reacting to their disease activity. So what are our risk prevention goals in IBD? We want to identify patients before they progress, and we want to identify patients who are at risk for that progression. So those are two fundamental um, processes that we need to put into place in IBD if we are going to actually change the natural history. The problem also is that not all patients are alike. So we have some patients who have a very mild course. No matter what you throw at them, they still have five aptus ulcerations in their ileum and two in their cecum. You could give them whatever they want. There's absolutely no change. And patients don't progress. They stay the same throughout their trajectory and natural history of their disease versus those who have a very complicated or aggressive um, disease phenotype for which we need to intervene early. So what is that crystal ball? We've tried since 2006, really, which was the first time at our national meeting that there was actually a session, the first Sunday session of the meeting was focused on the natural history of IBD. We've never even talked about that. We never even had those words about predicting or thinking about factors that actually tell me how my patient is going to behave. And the first talk was focused on clinic, meaning what are clinical factors that actually predict and interestingly enough, the title of this publication in, our, in Gastro, which is sort of our signature journal, was Predictors of Disabling Crohn's Disease. That was in 2006. So 12 years ago, the idea that you needed a biologic meant you were disabled in terms of this, um, the language used to say you have bad disease. Now, the use of a biologic would not define you as disabling, it's just appropriate care. And it's no longer considered, and now it's considered conventional therapy. Back then, the idea of a biologic was, again, you had to earn it, and you had to fail less effective therapies that were actually not as safe. So there was a lot, there's, as, I mean, I hope I present this very complex picture that we have to sort of chip away at, which will hopefully result in improving the future of IBD patients. Now, endoscopically, we think that the um, depth of the ulcerations and perhaps the length of the ulceration segment is important. We know that MREs or cross-sectional imaging can help us understand the bowel wall, is it already um, progressed to bowel wall thickness? Is it already obstructed? Are there already bowel wall damages? Because you have to understand, today in the current era, we do not have therapies that reverse bowel wall damage. So when I say about a window of opportunity, I mean we have to get them before fibrosis and uh, bowel wall damage has set in. 
Genetically, unfortunately, uh, there has not been sort of a gene phenotype link per se that we've been able to say you are this gene positive, you need this therapy because you're going to progress. Genetics have been shown to be tied to where your disease sets up shop. It's much more tied to location. So NOD2, which was the first gene, um, Judy Cho, who's here, was actually um, one of the first to identify the NOD2 gene in 2001, um, reported, and it was NOD2. And since then, NOD2 remains actually, believe it or not, despite fancy genome-wide association and advance in technology, NOD2 still remains a very important genetic susceptibility gene and may be tied to, uh, as I noted, location, and we're exploring whether or not really it has any link to prognosis. Serologies and lab markers, so there are biomarkers, there are blood tests that I'm going to show you in a moment, which are, interestingly, these are antibodies that are targeted against bacterial antigens. If you think about celiac disease, is an antibody targeted against dietary antigens. The diet is causative in celiac. What's interesting is that these antibodies that were found to be present in people with IBD and very low prevalence in those without IBD happen to be antibodies against microbial antigens, which is great because the philosophy or the hypothesis in IBD is that in a genetically susceptible host, you're having you're having an abnormal immune response to your own gut flora. So the idea being is that maybe these represent loss of tolerance to our bacteria, and they are important as predictors of disease, which I'll walk you through some really cool stuff that has been done recently, uh, led by our team here with John Fred Colin Bell. There's also the idea that maybe fecal markers, maybe we should be looking in the stool. This is, again, a microbial-based disease, the microbiome, the stool. There may be a signal as to whether or not there's a signature in there that represents what the gut is uh, expressing, or perhaps, probably more importantly, we've now uh, found that probably one of the best predictors of prognosis, particularly in children, is if you go directly to the mucosa at the time of diagnosis, and you run gene expression analysis on the tissue akin to what you would do in oncology, where you actually look at what is being expressed in the tumor and targeting therapy directly to that. So we're trying to advance in the concept that probably blood tests are not going to be as, effect, as, as accurate, genetics have not borne out, serologies may be helpful, but why don't we go to the tissue itself, see what the predominant biology <coughs> is in the tissue, and develop a treatment or target a treatment that we already have to that individual's biology. So the uh, clinical guide, guidance, um, our national society, the American GI uh, Association, has sort of put out for the community a very simple way of thinking about when you have a newly diagnosed patient, let's start with the clinical characteristics that do actually put your patient in what we call a moderate to high risk of complication. At least start with that. Look at your patient's uh. clinical scenario, their endoscopy, their um, labs, and look at whether or not they're, now I can tell you so under 30, less than 30, for those of us who manage, yesterday I saw a three-year-old who was diagnosed with IBD. Clearly that's a very different type of IBD than someone who's 29. So the age of 30 is sort of this arbitrary cut point, which I don't think really um, gets to what is risk or not, and I'll show you the pediatric data in a minute. If you have extensive small bowel disease, that's like urgent. You need to not mess around and give steroids and uh, aspirin-based therapy to a disease that is very extensive because the last thing you want is to resect a large segment of small bowel disease. Only problems can result from that. Patients who have severe rectal disease, severe perianal disease, uh, rectovaginal, rectolabial, uh, anal labial fistulas. This is really probably one of the most malignant forms of IBD when you start having per perianal penetrating disease, prior surgery, and of course, if you've already had a complication, you're at risk, higher risk of having another. So these are very simple concepts that don't get to the biology, but they actually just delineate some key uh, clinical markers that may ignite a physician to say, you know what, I'm going to go straight for an effective therapy because this patient is at risk of developing a complication. So in terms of the serologies, the serology sto story started actually a very long time ago. We first published this in 2008 in a large cohort of about 800 children that were diagnosed with Crohn's disease, and we looked at whether or not there were serologic immune markers that actually predicted the natural history of these children. 
who presented uncomplicated. And what we saw is we actually looked at all of these markers in totality and said, if a patient has a lot of antibodies against these bacterial antigens, they're yelling or crying for help. The concept that there's a lot of ulceration, there's a high degree of inflammation, there's loss of global tolerance to your own bacteria. And what we found is that kids who actually had a higher number of these serologies, meaning measured three out of the three at the time, their rate of surgery and complications were up compared to patients who had zero or one of these antibodies, meaning there was a correlation between how much sort of loss of tolerance you have and how complicated your disease course is going to be. And these were children who actually, within a three-year time frame, complicated, and these serologies predicted that this was going to happen in these patients. So we wanted to validate this prospectively. This is a huge study called the RISC cohort, which is funded by the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. This started in 2008. We collected over 1,000 pediatric newly diagnosed Crohn's patients from 29 sites across North America. And we wanted to see whether those patients who were uncomplicated at the time of diagnosis, whether there were predictors of whether or not this patient would complicate. Similar story to what we did in the 2008 publication, but we wanted to look at this prospectively uh, in patients that were newly diagnosed. And what's interesting is we didn't protocolize treatment, and we only had 9% of kids complicate within the first three years of life, and I can tell you that the majority of them ended up on anti-TNF therapy within the first six months of diagnosis. So the idea that this is sort of a window into what happens when you possibly treat early, when you actually intervene in, in children, you actually are only having a very low rate of complication, which is wonderful. Um, but one other story was, was there a way that we could predict up front so we can help families understand why their child needs to be on a biologic therapy, which again, if you think a patient feels they have to earn it, it's a very complicated discussion to actually discuss that with a parent when the black box warning for anti-TNF therapy says that you will die of a fatal hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma in adolescent males. This is what it says. Of course it doesn't say that. In their, in their interpretation, it says that. And so try you know, having this discussion that your child's at risk for complication, they have all these risk factors, but my child feels fine but they're not going to be fine. You know, this is a very important conversation because if you get the disease early and control a disease in childhood, you will have a much better adulthood with the disease. So we're really setting the stage for what the future could be like um, for adults with IBD. What was very interesting is we did find that gender and age and race actually was tied to whether or not a patient complicated. But this, for the first time, was where we went to the tissue. And we actually saw that there were specific signatures at diagnosis before any treatment that predicted a patient would develop scar tissue versus a patient that was not going to develop scar tissue but was actually going to develop internal penetrating fistulizing Crohn's. At diagnosis, without having a treatment, without having any progression, these patients were not strictured and not fistulized at the time of diagnosis. And these patterns actually predicted that there was going to be a complication. What's interesting, which I find really interesting, is that the extracellular matrix pathways, which is really about collagen and restructure of the, of the gut wall, was elevated in patients who went on to complicate with strictures. So the idea that maybe if we went to the tissue at diagnosis and there was a signature that said you were going to complicate, we would appropriately use a therapy that prevents stricture, bowel wall damage, and muscle hypertrophy. So what we showed, interestingly, is that one of the antibodies against a flagellin, which is part of these immune markers that I noted that we first published in 2008, that no matter what you threw at these, at these patients into a model, this microbial antigen was very, was very much an important risk factor for internal penetrating complication. So this was a blood test that we have commercially available, I think, for 12 years now or so. But what's really interesting is that the extracellular matrix gene expression withstood in this, in this uh, model as a predictor of stricturing complication, not fistulizing. 
So again, it goes to the idea that maybe we will have tools that we can actually predict without needing to put this crystal ball together and sort of a mishmash of everything. Maybe the gene expression is the end result of all of it. And that if we would just go to the tissue at time of diagnosis, we can predict the natural history of this patient with IBD. What's interesting is we actually gave some serum to um, one of our collaborators at the University of Michigan. And they actually did the ECM signature using a proteomic platform in the serum. And they actually found that patients who had the highest level of extracellular matrix expression in the blood developed strictures. So the question is, maybe there's a blood test we could develop that actually ties to the mucosa. So far, proteomic platforms have not been as predictive as the tissue itself. So really, we need to start working on ways where we can get um, either a more accurate way of the expression in the, in the bloodstream or techniques where we can just do gene expression on everybody at time of diagnosis. So how do we translate this to a patient? I mean, there's a lot that goes on in that 15 minutes. You know, that you need, to, I had to explain all of this in 15 minutes to a patient who's actually coming to see whether or not someone who recommended infliximab or adalimumab or a biologic is an appropriate therapy because they're very frightened about the side effect profile. Absolutely legitimate. Black box warning is a very scary thing when you read it and your child fits into that category. Um, therefore, they always want reassurance. And part of it is how do we explain that the risk of the disease itself is higher than any treatment we would use to manage it. How do you actually make that click and uh, really start to connect all these pieces in that short period of time in, in front of the patient? So a colleague of ours who was one of um, Bruce's fellows when he was in Massachusetts, Corey Siegel, um, is married to um, a very smart PhD system dynamics analysis um, woman. And she, unfortunately, has been uh, looking for a job because her model of system dynamics analysis was to predict climate change. And you can imagine that um, thing, times are tough right now for global warming and climate change. So um, Corey, she needed a job. So Corey said, what if we use this type of modeling to predict the natural history of diseases that have different outcomes where you can throw a whole bunch of variables to predict outcomes? and use this kind of methodology which goes beyond classic like hazard ratios or Cox proportional or using logistic regression. This is actually a different uh, analytic technique and so it provides real-time predictions of outcomes. It's very simple. I'll show you a control panel of what it would look like. It graphically conveys risk over a time and you can add new data to the existing model. So it's very malleable and flexible and you can really nimble so you can actually put in treatment issue is treatment into the model. You can really throw in different uh, variables if they have a hazard ratio that has already been validated and you can add it to the model. So this was our prototype. We first did it in those, in those children that I showed you from 2008 with those serologic immune markers predicting complication. We said, how does it look to a patient? Rather than just give them a, a list of all the things that they or their child have, what if we graphically displayed it <coughs> using toggles to actually move the toggles to individualize the disease location, their own gender, their age of diagnosis, their serologies, their genetics? What would it look like? So if we took a patient, these are real patients in that uh, group of patients that we looked at um, 10 years ago, and this was patients who fell into someone, a 16-year-old female who had small bowel and perianal disease, as well as positive for all the possible serologic immune markers we were measuring at the time. What is her risk if I actually toggled all these factors in? So when you're sitting in front of a patient, you say, our data suggests that by year two, there's a 100% likelihood that your child will have a complication. The mom's gonna say, well, how do I know that the treatment that you're recommending is actually gonna change that natural history? So what we did is we went back to the charts of these 800 patients or so, and we actually looked at what treatment they received within the first 90 days. Because the theory is what you do in the first 90 days will shape the biology. That's sort of the, the, the thought about early effective intervention. So in this group, who got 6-MP or azathioprine or thiopurines, which is sort of like 
This is the mothership of 6MP, Dan Present, the late Dan Present, first published in New England Journal in 1980. It sort of became a Northeast thing and then sort of spread across the country as being the steroid sparing strategy. Okay. Um, probably not the most effective therapy we have, and unfortunately that black box warning that comes with TNF, it's actually driven by the thiopurines and not the TNF. And unfortunately, to get TNF when it first came out, you had to fail conventional thiopurine therapy. So most people were on it, failed it, added to it, kept on it because there was this fear that everyone was going to get antibodies against these foreign proteins. Therefore, the idea was, let's use a thiopurine to lower the risk of antibodies against these TNFs, and people would stay on it for decades, literally. So the problem was is that when we uncovered and unraveled this black box warning, particularly in pediatrics, the only malignancies that were happening were kids who were either on combination thiopurine plus TNF or thiopurines alone. So. That was the unraveling of the black box. That takes another 15 minutes to explain why you're not using, you know. So this, all, again, this is all happening in one visit when you're hoping to actually be able to express the importance of risk. So early, t early immunomodulators did really nothing to the risk in this cohort of patients. And then when we used early TNF in those people who actually used TNF within 90 days, we literally had an absolute risk reduction of complications of 75%. And just for David in the room, when we use steroids, it increased the rapidity to complication. So Dan would be very proud. So Dan used to tell us that, you know, not to use steroids because they actually worsen the rate of complication. He's right. So that was in the pediatric model. And then we said, well, let's look at it in adults and do we find the same variables that predict complication in kids to predict the uh, complications in adults. And so we validated this in close to 700 adult uh, Crohn's patients. And again, you could see that these are the variables that actually bore, bared, uh, were sort of risk factors, some were protective, meaning if you have left colon disease, you're not going to typically get strictures in penetrating disease. So there are factors that are predictive, but small bowel disease, that's where a lot of our issues occur, especially with bowel obstructions and strictures, is typically an ileal or ileocecal problem. These serologies remained a big part of this conversation. So what are these serologies? You know, these have been really, we've been chasing what are these serologies and we've not found the specific driver of it. We hypothesize as to what bacteria drive them. ASCA is Antisaccharomyces cerevisiae. We don't actually think that Crohn's disease is tied, per se, to Antisaccharomyces cerevisiae, but the idea being is that it shares a cell wall homology with sort of the carbohydrates or oligosaccharides on the cell wall that resembles a bacteria that's involved in Crohn's. Now, that sounds very uh, sort of loose in my definition, but that's sort of a hypothesis as to why these variables are important. Anyways, we, we validated in another cohort from Mount Sinai in Toronto, and also revalidated in that pediatric cohort that I uh, showed you the first model. And one of the questions that comes up is, all right, you're telling me that when you look back at a whole bunch of IBD patients, Crohn's patients, you came up with variables that predicted the natural history. Now you have to go in and test it, and you tell me, does your model really predict complication prospectively? Like, if you applied it to real world, can you actually say that your model predicted whether a patient would complicate? So this is what happened, is that when we took um, Crohn's patients who were not on biologics and not on immunomodulators, who presented, there was I think 15 sites um, across the country that were involved in this study where we randomized people to either get nothing, meaning talk to the physician, I just don't mean to say nothing, meaning they don't get an app, they don't get an intervention, but they actually get a conversation just like what we're having versus a patient who goes to a web portal sees their personal prognosis online and also has a decision support aid that actually explains the risk of lymphoma, what is really behind risk of disease, and sort of educates, and we randomize people to one or the other. And so what was interesting is that if you just take the first 123 patients, we have 200 that finished the study, you can see that the majority of Crohn's patients are predicted to either have moderate or high risk of complication. So only a small percentage, less than 20% of our patients, if we took all comers at the time of diagnosis and you applied a risk tool, would actually be predicted to complicate. What's interesting is so far in one year, the good news is the people who complicated were indeed in the high risk predicted group. So we were able to show that in those patients who complicated, more of them came from the group that were predicted to do it. 
So that's a positive thing when your tool actually predicts what actually happened. But probably more importantly is, how does a patient see it? So not only are we combating lymphoma, we're actually combating marijuana. So 28-year-old musician from Maine, moderately active ileal Crohn's disease, manages his Crohn's disease with marijuana. He's part, he thankfully was randomized to the intervention arm. This was his pr prediction tool. Got it on Friday, Monday called, said, I want adalimumab. He's now on adalimumab plus methotrexate combination and is in um, and scoped and uh, achieved our outcome of uh, greater than 50% rate of mucosal healing. So the idea being is that you may be able to actually predict what the natural history is and help you communicate to patients whether or not you could engage them in a visual of what their own personal IBD trajectory is because our biggest problem is Aunt Mabel who took tree bark and is cured of Crohn's disease. That is, I think, our biggest issue because they bring a lot of the family history or what other people or what's online or diet and sugar and all kinds of stuff, gluten, and therefore we have to really say, you know what, that may be great for the person who's actually not going to complicate fully whatever you want to do if you want to try diet, alternative medication. But in someone who biologically is going to complicate, you must go after the biology. So that's sort of our conversation. So that was the concept of prediction. So let's now dabble in the idea of prevention. I don't think we ever in our minds ever thought we would tie the term prevention with IBD. I just don't think those two words came together. Um, and really, John Frank Colin Bell sort of is uh, sort of um, should be thanked for bringing this and challenging us to think that maybe we have a way of actually predicting who's going to get disease. Whoever thought of that concept in IBD, as I noted, if we're going to understand it and we're going to change the trajectory of people who will get it, we need to start behaving like we understand what happens preclinically. So, when you think about staging prevention, I just really walked you through tertiary prevention, which is in those patients who have IBD, who are at risk of complication, preventing them from complicating. That's in those existing patients. But let's talk about secondary prevention because that's really where we're gonna be able to actually change and prevent and intercept, hopefully, preclinical to avert clinical disease in those patients who are most at risk. So the diabetes folks are leading the way. They've you know, shown us that 100% of children who are consistently positive for two pancreatic islet autoantibodies will develop IBD within a 15-year period, 100%. I mean, that is pretty final. You know, it's like, if you have this, you will get it. So the question is, can you intervene? Islet antibodies can be detected between nine months and two years of age in genetically at-risk newborns, so babies born to moms, for example, with diabetes, suggesting that maybe initiating an environmental trigger may occur in utero or early <coughs> postnatal life. So there's a lot of emphasis on this concept of in utero and immune priming in utero. Um, so prevention trials are underway in these diseases. You know, in the, um, there's different approaches, either oral insulin, sub-Q insulin, abatacept, in patients who are family history of type 1 diabetes, and autoantibodies. So there's a lot of interest in this space in the diabetes, and we thought, is it possible? Does diabetes look like or feel like enough IBD in terms of there's a trigger, there's a gene, there's an environmental factor? The only difference maybe is the microbiome piece, which I'm not sure about um, the role of microbiome in, di in the diabetic space, but maybe there's a lot of research being done in that as well, and I'll show you some of the studies being done in the meconium in children. So in IBD, there has been some work done looking at the preclinical phases of IBD, and what's interesting is they've mainly been focused on those serologies, which are the thought process is if diabetics, in diabetes you can have autoantibodies, in celiac you have autoantibodies and you're following babies who are born who are um, antibody positive for celiac for example, or babies born to moms with celiac disease. And for us, we thought, well, maybe these microbial antigens, again, and getting back to the understanding of the hypothesis of why IBD happens, is maybe there's a blood test that will actually predict that you have an abnormal response to your own gut flora. That's the concept behind serology. So taking that one step further, we've actually, um, we have three signature foundational platforms that we have here at Sinai um, that are really focused on prevention. The first one is the PREDICT study, which I'll show you, which is really looking at U.S. Army recruits. So they actually take um, our 
people who are entering the army, they get a physical, they get blood test every two years, and they followed them until either they develop IBD or they don't thus far. Meconium study and multiplex Orthodox Jews family cohorts, I'll show you in a minute. So this is a, the very complex US Army study um, and the idea that we are able to follow individuals who probably are not known to be high risk individuals. Genetically, they're not an at risk um, phenotype that we would have proposed. Um, so the idea being is that this is more of the general population uh, risk of IBD and following these patients over time with serum and proteomics. And again, here goes the serologies as being an important factor that maybe are present before disease and looking at some somologic platforms as well. So what's interesting is they looked at whether or not serologies and a somologic platform uh, profiles such as CRP, which is great because CRP is a marker of inflammation, and then also complement 9, which again, uh, biologically, I don't know why C9 was actually one of the, one of the factors that increased the, um, the yield of diagnosis. But what they saw is that if you looked at serologies alone, out to five years before diagnosis, these serologies were present. So something is happening to drive serologies, and even five years out, it had an, a, an AUC of 0.69, got progressively better as you got closer to the date of diagnosis. So they actually had serum every two years before <coughs> diagnosis in the US Army. And they were actually able to show that CRP increases the area under the curve from 0.76 to 0.84, and actually predicting who's gonna get IBD. This is not sort of in an at-risk individual. These are genetic, the, sorry, the general population risk of getting IBD, and then you could see that the AUC doesn't really change by adding complement nine. So the idea that there are biomarkers in the blood that predict whether a patient will actually be at risk or get IBD, more importantly and more to sort of what I'm interested in is do these serologies indeed predict complications as we've been talking about for a decade? And what's interesting, in those US Army recruits who did develop IBD and who did complicate had higher levels of these serologies. So these serologies are not only a marker of that you're gonna get it, but it's also a marker of prognosis. So there's something interesting, again, unfortunately we don't know too much about them, despite 20 years of sort of searching for them and, and trying to understand what they do. So the other really cool project, which is Inga Peter and uh, her team um, here, which is the meconium study, which also sort of goes on the backs of what has been done in diabetes, where they took moms, who were born uh, with babies who have IBD, the mums have IBD, looked at the meconium of those babies born to mums with IBD versus mums born, versus babies born to mums without IBD. Seeing whether or not the baby at birth already has an at-risk microbiome profile for IBD and how does it compare to a baby born to a mum who doesn't have IBD. The idea being that the initial intestinal colonization of the infant gut is thought to prime, you know, to prime the immune response. So it could even be happening in utero. So imagine the idea that if you took meconium from a baby born to moms without IBD, this is sort of our diaper collection, um, out to three years now, by the way. So we're collecting saliva for genetics and looking at the, the meconium and then the dad's uh, microbial environment and the baby's poop out to three years. But the idea even more interesting is there was a difference in the microbiome patterns for babies born to mums with IBD versus babies born to mums without. Remember, this is the first stool of the baby, of the newborn. And the idea that already it has at risk or what we call pro-inflammatory microbial profile is interesting. Probably more interesting is that when these stools were transplanted into the mouse, the mice who got IBD were mice who got the poop from the babies born to the mums with IBD and not the mice who got the poop from the babies born to mums without IBD. I know it seems complicated, but imagine what I'm saying. The idea that the stool already, say that like 20 times, the stool already at birth reflected an at-risk microbiome pattern. So can we develop an interception strategy where we can actually reverse the microbiome profile that a baby is born with in utero? So that's the meconium piece. And our last sort of signature um, profile is our uh, Orthodox Jewish multiplex family. 
This has really um, been an incredible opportunity to work with the community. Our goal is that obviously we believe that of all the cohorts in the world, they have the highest risk of IBD, so the highest genetic susceptibility risk. Already Ashkenazi Jewish patients have a higher risk of particularly Crohn's, but the Orthodox community has, uh, we believe, to be even an increased risk above that. So the goal is to collect as many families as, as we can, and believe it or not, we have recruited close to 100 multiplex Orthodox Jewish families. We have over 600 genetics, stools, serum, hair and teeth are not quite 600, but I'll get to that in a minute. And we're actually looking at, first, as a cross-sectional level, looking at the microbiome patterns in families that have at least three first-degree relatives. So we have 100 families of three first-degree relatives that are affected with IBD. So genetically, I'd say it's probably your highest risk cohort you're ever going to find. And if you're going to find an intervention strategy, it would be in the unaffected siblings, the younger kids, of those who are at most at risk of getting disease. Um, you could see that Asher is an anomaly. Everyone else is quite, um, <laughs> he got the Jewish hygiene, whichever that is, but um, the, and so we all went to, this is our first community outreach event, which was in Muncie, which is Bruce's hometown. Um, and we went there to have a community event with the, with the, with, um, the Jewish uh, individual in the community to sort of talk about why we think this community is so important. And that was our first event, and now we've been able to collect close to 100 families um, throughout all of New York and New Jersey. Um, so the idea, this is an example of a pedigree that we collect. So these are um, one family, uh, and the um, complexity around tracking um, the siblings and um, sort of generations. So I'm just going to focus in on one of the families and talk to you about the affected individuals. This is one of our families. So these are all the affected individuals that are within this family. Um, so, and a lot of them marry within, are married to other families that may be related families. So there's, we're finding genetically that they are, some are more related than known. So um, there's uh, interesting uh, results from the genetics. So one of the, as Judy's very proud of that. So one of the, um, one thing that was interesting and a finding that I think we found really interesting is that the way that IBD happens is not random. That what's really happening is that they're clustering. That you tend to get, for example, one proban, and then the person next in line is really based on birth order somewhat. So there's a clustering. So genetics would be that it would be random, right? So if it was purely genetics. But it means, most likely, that the environment that these three individuals shared probably shaped their microbiome and therefore speaks to the importance of understanding the difference in these three individuals' microbiome and the microbiome of the youngest that is 10 years, 12 years away. And that way we can start to hatch away at, are there environmental or microbiome similarities that are tied to exposure? There's a very good chance that these three individuals shared a room, possibly shared a bed, shared a bathroom. Um, so there's a lot of overlap in terms of the environment. So now we're digging deep into what are the microbial patterns, not just genetics, in these events that are happening non-random. We also looked at genetic risk scores because the idea that maybe there's a genetic enrichment and that we would have imagined, at least our hypothesis interestingly, was that the more genetic risk you have, the younger you will get the disease. So far that hasn't borne out, interestingly, that our genetic risk scores have not predicted age of onset. That what's also interesting in this group, the age of onset is the same as what it is in the general population to date, 19, 18, 18 to 20. So we haven't really seen that genes are, and I always, with Judy in the room, I feel so terrible saying that I'm not sure genetics are the whole story, Dr. Cho. So the idea that, <laughs> that um, you could see here, we just looked at gene risk scores, and obviously affected individuals have a higher gene risk score, but unaffected individuals look similar to our controls to date. So we're just looking at whether genes do uh, Im increase risk in this very at-risk individuals. But one thing that was very interesting, because a lot of the community will ask us, will I get IBD? 
am I at risk, and what are sort of, is there an age cutoff for which if I didn't get it by a certain age, the chances are low that I'll get it. So what's interesting here is that when we looked at the top 10th percentile of the genetic risk scores, 25-year-olds and above in these unaffected, these are the siblings and the family members that don't have disease, none of them had this high risk score. So the idea maybe being that after 24, we're not really seeing a diagnosis of IBD in, in this age group. So that maybe risk definitively drops after a certain cut point so that we should focus our attention on, the, on a group that's say 10 to 24, which is really where our, the meat of where we had most of our um, higher risk scores. So we're learning a lot from these, from these uh, high risk populations to sort of understand, can we develop a predictive biomarker that will tell us who's at risk? And the last thing that we brought in after the fact, given the uh, in excitement around the environment, obviously in the exposome, is we are collecting um, baby teeth as well as permanent teeth, if they lost them, that sounds bizarre, but you know, if you had your wisdom teeth out, not, we're not going around asking people for their permanent teeth, but the, because the baby teeth are like trees, and you can go back to the second trimester of exposure, so every ring, you know, you can actually look at exposures that go back to in utero. So if we can link an in utero exposure to an in utero microbiome in these genetic at-risk individuals, we hope that we can sort of advance the field significantly. And for and their hair every four months, in, when we're tracking the stool every four months, every centimeter of hair represents a month of exposure. So we're able to actually see in real time, four months at a time, exposures. Yeah. So understanding the preclinical stages of IBD might enable accurate identification of at-risk individuals who will develop disease and allow the development of preventative interventions and interception strategies that might modify the risk factors or target specific immune pathways underlying disease. So thank you so much for your attention. Onset of Crohn's is when they're old. Let's say when they're 60, 60. 70, mm -hmm. it seems to me that would be a great lead for some people to be studying with regard to the younger Crohn's. Do you or your colleagues study the biology of aging in these two age groups, the young and the old, both of whom start initially with Crohn's disease? So we're not personally looking at the age extremes as part of um, just in, our, in what we're doing research-wise. This is not where I am headed, but there are individuals who are definitively looking at what happens to the biology and the immune system above 60, for example. Why are we seeing another sort of node of individuals who are being diagnosed late in life? In UC, we're seeing a second blip because they stopped smoking for example, and smoking is protective against UC, but that's typically 40s, 50s, 60s, for example. But in Crohn's, why are we seeing another sort of blip of incidence? I don't, I have no knowledge of that in terms of biology. Is there a biologic difference, you think, immune-wise? Yeah, I think there might be. We don't study yeah. it, we don't know. 100%. Steve? That was an amazing talk. Thank you. Uh, you showed uh, your prediction model in children uh, for complications in Crohn's was, had tremendous accuracy. When you did your validation study in adults, you had moderate ADCs in the 0.74. 0.74, yeah. yeah. And then um, when you rolled it out for <coughs> clinical utility, uh, I saw you had the risk threshold. So your PPV is about 26% for your high risk threshold. Is that where you set it? And I, I, my question <coughs> is how do, you, how do you make the decision where to set your high-risk threshold to prescribe biologics, essentially, your decision-making process, right? And is it, I know you're going to individualize it at the end, but how do you come up with where is the high-risk cutoff for prescribing biologics? So um, let's just say that for me, in my mindset, I'm not saying that everyone yeah. will follow that, is anybody who is beyond low risk okay. needs something, uh, something that alters the biology. I don't care, I'm not sticking with one versus the other because I'm hoping our research will tell us which one, you know, if it's a fibrosis prediction, et cetera. I think that we recognize fully, well, first of all, this was just the first, like, 123, by the way, so we have to actually look at the data and the randomized, meaning 
Our primary outcome was not what I showed you, but I just wanted to show you that it actually works to predict risk in, uh, at one year. So our model was based on three years. So I do want to actually say that one year was just a window into what already happened at one year. The prediction tool is for three years from diagnosis. So I'll have more data for you once we follow them for three years. Hopefully it looks like the, the, for the retrospective one that we developed the model on in terms of its prediction. With the IBD, IBD community feels anyone above low risk should receive well, whatever I say is actually what happens. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, right, Bruce? <laughs> Probably, right? Yeah. Um, so that's where I'm trying to go in my teaching, to be honest. We are all the, yeah, we have so much work to do. It's not, I mean, if I can even get them to think about that beyond low risk, right. it's a plus, right? So I think it's more, can we move the needle a little bit? Yeah. And we also have to go after the patient, because that's a whole other thing. So whether or not visualizing your own personal risk, that may be more important to anything to help us move the needle. So totally respect exactly what you're saying. And so stay tuned for okay. what happens in the real world. Yeah. Carla, with regard to the meconium study, can you tell us a little more about the differences between cesarean and vaginal birth? Sure. Bearing in mind that cesarean is more likely to occur in mothers with active perianal disease. So, so far, we actually haven't seen a huge difference in this, remember, it's not the same numbers as a retrospective Swedish cohort where you can go back and look at IBD C-section. You know, those are easy, that's where really most of the data has come from in national databases where they, Copenhagen, Sweden, where they've actually said that babies who did not come through the, va the vaginal birth canal, which is where you acquire your microbiome, are at higher risk of IBD because it's more hygienic. Just that's the concept, right, of why C-section versus vaginal. In meconium, correct me if I'm wrong, Judy, they have not actually shown, maybe it's a numbers game, I don't know, but they haven't shown to date a difference between C-section and vaginal. I'm just, that's what we're seeing so far. Maybe we need more data. Your slides said corrected for delivery mode, so meaning, what, what kind of correction was that? Meaning they didn't, they, um, adjusted for very, the fact that we had more C-sections in women with IBD. Uh, okay, so that is a problem, not a problem, but you can't really be accurate because we're recommending C-section in even more than just perianal. A lot of women were recommending C-section because of the pelvic floor issues, et cetera, in women who've had pouches, for example. So we are, we're probably making that cause worse by recommending more C-sections. One last question. Your microbiome data was uh, very intriguing, and it's always interesting to think about how the immune system interfaces with disease states or propensity or genetic yeah. uh, modifiers and such. So my curiosity is whether you've looked at a cohort of even the orthodox population that's very insular versus not so insular to see if there's a diversity of the microbiome that comes from outside of this rather homogeneous population. Similarly to like why HPV is basically not seen in that population because if it doesn't enter into the community, there's no way to bring it in. So that's kind of the yeah. diversity. So there's another cohort in Canada called the GEM study. And they're actually, their only risk factor was if you had a first, one first degree relative. So mm -hmm. it's general sort of population, not, not, um, not influenced by ethnicity in any way. And it was across Canada. And they have now reached their 75th newly diagnosed um, first degree relative and they actually have the microbiome patterns at the time of entry into the study and the microbiome at the time of diag the diagnosis. So we're waiting for them to sort of look at their profiles and then we're going to valid we're going to cross validate whether our microbiome which could be totally related to their environment very different than the general population risk of just having one first degree relative, which is what the GEM study is, see if they overlap at all to at least start to see whether or not, if we developed a predictor, is it generalizable to outside populations, which is 100%. And the diet is different, right? So we know that there's kosher diet. You know, there are other foods are the same, but it's the kosher aspect, whether or not that means anything versus the general population. So we've got a lot of work to do, but this was just the first sort of glimpse of what we're looking at in these populations. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.